The subcommittee will come to order. So I want to uh, welcome everyone to today's hearing on the Department of Defense uh, Information Technology, uh, Cybersecurity, and Information uh, Assurance. Uh, this uh, is the subcommittee's first hearing on the department's current IT efforts and the requested uh, investments for fiscal year 2022. Since the subcommittee was formed at the start of the 117th Congress, our members have been eager and encouraged uh, to see the Department of Defense approach its information technologies with a uh, prioritization that has been lacking in the past. Of the many lessons from the pandemic, we have seen clearly that technology can revolutionize how we conduct our business, whether it's that's in Congress or in the Department of Defense. However, it also requires that the infrastructure which enables our technology is prioritized and secured in a commensurate way. In my many years in Congress, I have witnessed firsthand the progress that the Department has made in improving the ways in which it can utilize technology. Nevertheless, uh, there is still tremendous work to do. Year after year, we have leaders from uh, across the department uh, tell us that they uh, consider IT to be a priority uh, before immediately pivoting to discuss how much funding they need for more flight hours or uh, more aircraft or more tanks. Quite frankly, uh, I'd like to think that technology will truly uh, be a priority when, for example, the Chief of Naval Operations says that the Navy can live with one less fighter aircraft in favor of greater IT investment. Through multiple National Defense Authorization Acts, uh, the, the Congress has judged it prudent to empower the Chief Information Officer in managing the Department's technology portfolio. Today, uh, the CIO is a Senate-confirmed position, has oversight over each of the service's IT budgets, and manages not only the Department's networks, but also its electromagnetic spectrum enterprise and command and control and communications efforts. This places the CIO in a unique operationalized role, contributing to, su to success in the Department's no-fail missions. At the same time, uh, there are still questions about how the Department of Defense defines the role and responsibilities for uh, cyber matters. If the Secretary of Defense is asked who is in charge of buying weapons for the Department, the answer is unequivocal. Un unequivocal is the Undersecretary of Defense for Acquisition and Sustainment. Conversely, if the Secretary is asked who is in charge of keeping DOD networks safe, the fact that there isn't a single correct answer is troubling. The Secretary could respond with the, the Chief Information Officer or the, uh, the Commander of Cyber Command or even the, the Chiefs of the Military Services, and he, he wouldn't uh, technically be wrong in any of these responses. So. If we can teach every one uh, of our new officers about the criticality uh, of clear command and control, why can't uh, it apply, th uh, th apply this to the, uh, the highest levels of the department? So with that as the context, I want to welcome Mr. John uh, Sherman, who appears in front of the subcommittee to here today. Mr. Sherman uh, serves as the acting chief information officer. And while we have had the pleasure uh, to work uh, together since assuming the role in January. Uh, this is his first appearance before uh, a, uh, a Hask hearing. He is a career member uh, of the Senior Intelligence Service and previously served as Chief Information Officer uh, of the U.S. Intelligence Community. So uh, I thank you, Mr. Sherman, for your, your service and your commitment to the United States and, uh, and the work that you're doing in DOD. Um, but uh, before we get to you, I'd like to now yield uh, to uh, Mr. Franklin, who is stepping in for Ranking Member Banks. Um, Scott, the floor is yours. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Sherman, for your time here with us today. Uh, the Department's information technology and cybersecurity budget may not be the most riveting subject, but it is certainly one of the most critical. IT undergirds every department or every part of the department, whether it's protecting our defense networks from adversaries, managing the DOD's spectrum to ensure swift, clear communication with our troops around the world, or deploying IT or software, uh, secure software, IT is foundational from weapon systems to financial management. In an enterprise as large as the Department of Defense, with its many missions, different systems, and multiple stakeholders, we are fortunate there has not been a catastrophic IT failure, rendering our equipment no better than paperweights, or allowing adversaries to sit in our networks and capture sensitive information. 
I'm encouraged by the direction of the department, but this is not an area where we can afford to slow down. Without strategic vision, resourcing, and investment in the workforce, and buy-in from leadership in the department, failure is possible. The IT and cyberspace budget represents roughly 7% of the DOD budget, so every dollar must be used wisely. I look forward to hearing your views and justifications for the budget and how you're using the dollars to pursue modernization, efficiencies, and security. The Department of Defense has a technology deficit, and unless we make both the necessary investments and prioritizations, we risk weakening our national security, and none of us here wants that. With that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Excellent. Good. Very good. Thank you, Mr. Franklin. Um, with that, I want to turn to Mr. Sherman uh, for his opening statement. Thank you very much, sir. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member, and members of the subcommittee. Thank you for the opportunity to testify before the subcommittee today on the current efforts underway pertaining to the Department's information technology and cybersecurity. I am John Sherman, the Acting Department of Defense Chief Information Officer. The President's interim national security strategic guidance as well as Secretary Austin's priorities drive the key areas I will highlight regarding the Department's cloud, software and network modernization, cybersecurity work, workforce, command control communications, and data. In what I see as a critical step for the whole enterprise, we've made cloud computing a fundamental component of our global IT infrastructure and modernization strategy. With battlefield success increasingly reliant on digital capabilities, Cloud computing satisfies the warfighter's requirements for rapid access to data, innovative capabilities, and assured support. Furthermore, we remain committed in our drive to a, toward a multi-vendor, multi-cloud ecosystem with our FY22 cloud investments representing over 50 different commercial vendors, including commercial cloud service providers and system integrators. The department's cloud conversancy and ability to leverage this technology has definitely matured over the last several years, and we are driving hard to accelerate the, mo the momentum even more in this space. Software capabilities and networks are also critical to our success. I'm pleased to announce that we will release a software modernization strategy later this summer that builds on already developed guidance, such as DevSecOps 2.0 guidance released last month. We are dedicated to delivering resilient software capability at the speed of relevance. The FY22 budget includes investments to enable software modernization with cloud services as the foundation to fully integrate the technology, process, and people needed to deliver next generation capabilities. Meanwhile, the COVID-19 pandemic crisis changed the way we all work. The department deployed a commercial-based collaboration capability to enable the rapid transition to remote work. While cloud access and remote work introduces a significant burden to the DOD networks, we continue to deploy secure and agile solutions. All of these efforts must address cybersecurity from the start. The Secretary previously discussed the Department's investment in cybersecurity and cyberspace operations that will maintain the momentum of our digital modernization strategy. The FY22 DOD cybersecurity budget remains maintains enhanced funding levels established in FY20 and FY21 for key enterprise cybersecurity capabilities that will enable us to advance our focus on zero trust and risk management and drive our new invest investments to enhance resiliency and cyber defenses. We take our responsibilities in this area very seriously given the threat landscape we face. While all divisions on our CIO team support warfighting, it is command control and communications, or C3, that might be most closely linked to the warfighter on the ground, sea, air, and space domains. The critical capabilities in this portfolio, positioning, navigation, and timing, or PNT, electromagnetic spectrum enterprise, or MC, and 5G, are a key priority for the enterprise, especially as we face threats from our near-peer competitors. Finally, we often note that data is the ammunition of the future. The department has prioritized ensuring the timely, secure, and resilient access to data needed for military advantage in all domain operations. While data management is not directly tied to specific program elements in the FY22 budget request, we are identifying, assessing, and tracking our data-related investments as part of the budget certification process that I lead. In closing, I want to emphasize the importance of our partnership with Congress in all areas, 
but, in, but with a particular focus on digital modernization and IT reform. Thank you for the opportunity to testify this afternoon, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, so we're going to uh, go to member questions now, uh, as we recognize in order of seniority um, for five minutes. And I'll start with myself. Uh, uh, Mr. Sherman, um, first question I have, uh, and uh, I'm going to be direct. Uh, the department released a, a comprehensive summary document of its, uh, of its IT and, and cyberspace activities budget totaling uh, 30 pages. This year, uh, that same document is six pages, uh, only uh, two of which contain any substance. And separately, uh, this committee uh, has made your office aware that the IT and cyberspace activities portion of this year's defense uh, budget overview was nearly a carbon copy of the 2020 defense budget overview. I have to be honest with you, if, uh, if the Department of Defense were a, uh, a high school student, I would have called this plagiarism. So with all due respect, uh, if your office cannot be troubled to put together the necessary materials for this committee's uh, oversight, how can we trust the stewardship of this uh, critical portfolio? Mr. Chairman, thank you for the question, and I appreciate everything you're saying. The, and your staff had raised this with us a couple weeks ago. So a couple things happened on this as I've dug into this in my six months into the job, and particularly as it was raised recently. Part of the reduction in the length of the documents had to do with the CUI or controlled unclassified information designated that was put on it that in a way perhaps restricted the number of pages on there. But your point, sir, about the carbon copy is something I take very seriously. Your staff has raised this with me, and I will own this and ensure we get it better next time. And indeed, I have been laser focused on the technology and cybersecurity, but we need to do a bit better job in CIO working with Comptroller and other department colleagues in the level of product we share with you. So, sir, I'll take this guidance on and make it a priority going forward. And I appreciate you flagging it, sir. Without that level of detail, just to understand, we can't fulfill our oversight responsibilities. We're in the dark otherwise, and, uh, it, you know, that's, that's unacceptable going forward. So I take you at your word, and uh, we'll, we'll go from there. Um, also, in reviewing the department's budget materials, it would appear uh, that there are significant uh, challenges between uh, all the various DOD entities in harmonizing how uh, the department categorizes its cybersecurity and IT investments. Uh, for example, the Navy does not categorize endpoint device management tools as cybersecurity funding, yet uh, the Air Force does. As a result, uh, it is nearly impossible to get a comprehensive picture of how resources are being, uh, are being spent. How can our members uh, help you accelerate uh, the efforts to create uh, greater compliance and consistency uh, in understanding the Department's investments? Sir, thank you for that. I think some of this is what we need to be doing on our own within the CIO enterprise, working with our service and other colleagues as we work the budget year to year. To your point, and I took this once I got in the seat here, that our $5.5 billion for cybersecurity thereabouts doesn't indeed represent the totality of cybersecurity throughout the department. It's a large portion of it, but to your point about endpoint security, and I'll give another example of what we've done with DOD or Office 365 and some of the cybersecurity features we bought from the vendor on there are reflected in our enterprise and not cyber budget. Cybersecurity is my top priority as CIO, along with the other modernization activities. But to be able to reflect the totality of that is something we need to do a better job of. And I think we have the tools and wherewithal internally to work with our colleagues to make sure we can reflect this more accurately. But this is something, sir, I have noticed recently because the $5.5 billion, while an accurate assessment of cybersecurity, there are some more in the budget that we need to be able to reflect in there. So, sir, we'll take that on board as well. It's important. You know, having that common understanding is going to help us better understand, you know, where we are lacking capabilities, where we're investing in the right place, and uh, how our dollars are being spent. Um, uh, in, in the statement you submitted to the committee, uh, you noted that uh, you serve as the department's lead for industrial control system cybersecurity you also noted that the department uh, is working to build cybersecurity expertise in the, uh, the cyber uh, workforce. 
um, and are developing capabilities to monitor uh, ICS systems. So I have a few questions about this. Uh, first, does the department use the term ICS in operational technology uh, or OT inter interchangeably? To my understanding right now, we do, sir. This is an area of late that I've wanted to really dig on, uh, both back when I was the principal deputy CIO at the time and now as the acting CIO. To answer your question, I believe we use those interchangeably. I'm working with our chief information security officer just as recently as this week to start to gather the documentation we have on this to ensure that we at the, the departmental CIO level have the right sort of guidance and the articulation of terms, right? What you're getting at, sir, is we're using IoT, well, and I'll throw IoT, Internet of Things, in there as well, along with industrial control systems, operational technology, et cetera, to get at the main issue that we're not creating seams in our cybersecurity activities between the cyber defenders and our facility managers where an adversary could go after things like HVAC, elevators, and other places that would allow cyber vulnerabilities. So that's where we're at right now, sir. And, and what is the difference between uh, defense cyber workforce and the cyberspace operations forces? The, the I want to make sure I get this one right. The defense cyber workforce would include the way we characterize the work roles include the cyber workforce, I believe, in there, sir. The way we so the defense cyber workforce is based on a framework of the occupational series we have. I believe there's 54 of air, any type of individual, military or civilian, operating in cyber uh, cyber work roles in terms of. Uh, whether you're a coder, a cyber defender, et cetera. So this gets to the blocking and tackling we've been doing over the past couple of years to get our arms around the totality of our cyber workforce. So I will take that for the record to ensure I'm being correct on this, sir, but the cyber operators that are working for Cybercom and elsewhere are included in our broader cyber workforce framework that we put together to allow us to get the fidelity we need on these occupational series and the work roles so we can look all the way across the dozens of work roles with the fidelity we need to be able to characterize the uh, tens of thousands of individuals we have in this area, sir. And the last questions I have, and then I'm going to yield to the ranking member, uh, and hopefully we'll get a second round in too. But uh, do the efforts that your uh, your statement describe extend to the cyber mission force uh, and/or the cyber operations forces? And will the cyberspace operations forces uh, have uh, dedicated elements for OT cybersecurity? Sir, I want to take that one for the record and make sure I give you the right answer on that. I would see the the IoT, the industrial control system, absolutely involving our cybercom colleagues on this. But in terms of how we're going to structure this, it's frankly early in the movie on this, and I want to make sure I get the right answer for you on that, sir. But this is a priority for me, especially post-colonial pipeline. This was a wake-up call. And again, the department has been on this, but what can be done to ICS? I want to ensure we're putting all the piece parts of this together, so I will need to take that one for the record as well, sir. Well, we look forward to getting the follow-up from you uh, for the record. Uh, with that, I'm going to hold there and yield to the ranking member. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Sherman, it's my understanding that the Department of Defense allows unpatched software to remain on the network for 120 days before being removed. When our adversaries are increasingly looking to attack us from the cyber domain, uh, can you highlight what the department's doing to reduce this time frame, time frame and make sure our systems are not vulnerable? And then part two of that, do you have the authorities necessary to require the services and components to act? Thank you, sir. I believe we do absolutely have the authorities we need on this, and this gets into the broader cybersecurity push we have, looking at things like our risk management framework, the standards we have about how long software can remain on our network, and indeed, one of my absolute main priorities is we move to a zero trust architecture, getting after things like unpatched software, but also an overall holistic approach to how we structure our networks and making it assume that the bad guys are going to get on there. And how do we segment things, ensure it's patched as quickly as possible, and have the very best tools and approach on this. So, sir, this is something 120 days. It's probably too long. We would need to take a look at that. But this gets to the broader push I've also got the CISO working on to how can we do this better to ensure as we look at peer competitors and non-state actors that know they're coming at this, that that is not what we want to be able to maintain there, sir. So we will be looking at that.
Very good. In your testimony, you state that not all priorities can be satisfied in each budget. That's pretty much the standard for, for all, the, all the different departments that come before us. But can you highlight what's not being satisfied in the president's budget and what risks are there associated with those unfunded priorities? Well, sir, I would say the main priorities are all being answered in the president's budget. We do have some risk areas that bother me, though, as CIO, and these have been enduring, and I think my predecessors would have said the same thing. You mentioned about the software patching. That's something immediately on our networks. Working with our colleagues in acquisition sustainment, I really want to put our shoulder into weapon systems and critical infrastructure, recognizing that our adversaries are going to be coming after those, too, and moving just beyond the Department of Defense Information Network under my charge, but looking, again, at weapon systems and elsewhere where we can work with General Nakasonia's team at Cybercom, work with ANS. And those are some risk areas that, because some of these programs were started in the 90s when cybersecurity was in a different place, we have a better way to come at this. That's the type of area, sir, where I think we're carrying some risk that I want to do a better job of working with our colleagues in the department. Okay. And what, one final question for this round. Recent cyber attacks, such as those on the Colonial Pipeline and a water treatment facility back in my home state of Florida, have highlighted that critical infrastructure and utilities are becoming more integrated with traditional IT networks and therefore can be more exposed to cyber risks. How could the DOD's mission be impacted by such attacks on critical infrastructure and utility operations technology? And what are the department's plans to ensure an adequate level of protection to those assets that's commensurate with risk? Yes, sir. That gets exactly to what I was mentioning with the, the chairman's question on this as well. Uh, ICE industrial control systems, operational technology, and we'll get the terminology all right on this, but exactly what you're talking about, a cyber attack not necessarily launched on our networks, but against our water supply, our heating and cooling uh, on a data center somewhere that could be the same as a kinetic kill on something, but they would, and shutting the water off for cooling, any number of things that affect our operations on our installations. What I didn't appreciate until I got into this job was there could be seams we need to address. And so, again, this is one of our priorities is I'm having our team do a close look at what policies we have in place. Is it directive enough? Is it suggestive and we need to roll in harder on this? What I don't want to have happen is any seams between the outfield or so to speak, between facilities, cybersecurity, and elsewhere where our adversaries could find a gap and get after us and hurt our facilities in the NCR or one of our installations or overseas or our war fighting ability. So this is a priority, sir, and it is in progress as we're looking at this. And again, as recently as this week, we've been working on this. Great. Thank you, Mr. Yes. Mr. Sherman. I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Franklin. Uh, Mr. Larson is now recognized for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, uh, Mr. Sherman, good to see you. In your testimony on page 10, you, uh, page 9 and 10, you discuss 5G in particular um, that uh, I think you say that the department is ready to make available uh, 3.45 to 3.65, uh, but you have concerns about the 3.1 to 3.45. Uh, is this a setting in which you can explain some of your concerns uh, about um, the mission and operational impact on the 3.1 to 3.45? Yes, sir, at a high level. So the 3.45 to 3.65 are areas we've actually been able to vacate or in the process of vacating. The, the, the other one, the 3.1 and up to 3.45, this other band, yep has quite a bit of DOD activity in it in the continental United States and our territories for radars and other capabilities that are used for training as well as real world operations, homeland security and so on. Whereas we've been able to vacate or in the process of outright vacating those other bands, this one's going to be trickier where we're going to need to learn and be able to share that uh, where we can have some sort of relationship if this becomes available working with FCC and Commerce NTIA to where, I'll give you an example of the kind of vision we have on this, would be, say, an Aegis-class uh, cruiser down in Norfolk needs to be able to bring up their very powerful radar, but not every day, maybe certain days of the month. But when that illuminates, it can go well into the tidewater region, as I understand it. Well, hopefully we're able to, to walk and chew gum where we can work out arrangements where on those days that cruiser has to bring the radar up 
there could be some sort of sharing of that spectrum. That's what I'm getting at with that band, that 3.1 to 3.45, recognizing there's a lot, and I just used a naval example. There are plenty of others that operate in that space where our soldiers, sailors, airmen, Marines, and guardians have to be able to operate in that space. And again, some of it is for real-world operational activity. AWACS is an example. So that's what we're looking at. We want the U.S. to be a 5G dominant nation, but we also have to maintain these DOD operational needs, but we think we can work this out, and that's what we're looking at in that band, sir. Yeah, well, we, you might know we, we've been trying to help you all work that out um, as well. Um, it's been uh, fits and starts a little bit. Uh, so can you discuss, uh, um, does, does CIO have a role, and what would you assess the progress of the uh, 5G pilot projects? You don't have to go through all 12, but... Do you have general thoughts right now? Yes, sir. We absolutely have a role. So we work with our research and engineering college, yeah. USDRNE. They have the lead. We work it as a from the CIO side with the standards piece, uh, working it closely with them and working it, I don't want to say at a more strategic level, but there is a very close partnership where they're working directly with the services. And, sir, you're aware of all 12 at yeah. logistics and health care and aircraft maintenance and everything else where we're working the standards piece and working with the higher-level interlocutors at FCC and Commerce and elsewhere. So it is a very good coupling between their leadership working with the stakeholders on the pilots and us working it from a CIO standards, policies, I don't want to say oversight yet, but that piece of it. So we do have a very close part. When, when, those, when those are done or when there's some assessment, I noted in your testimony, you said the CIO gets those by in 2024 is here. So will you, will you, will the, the CIO office be taking the, the operational role at some point? I think we need to define exactly what that means, sir. But, yes, well, I think we're going to have that, as it mentioned in my, my written submission, and by 2024, and what does that look like? And as our colleagues in R&E uh, move on to 6G yeah, and next right. g and keep leading us in that direction to stay ahead of our adversaries. So, yes, sir, I see us as having the overall baton. But to be honest, we have to define exactly what that's but, going to look yeah, like. Yeah, okay. And, but that makes an, a, a broader assumption as well that then CIO will be, for lack of a better term, you'll be the repository for 5G, um, not not military operations, but you you will be the the keeper of, of 5G for the department once, yes. it's, once we're using it. Yes, sir. That's based on that assumption subject to administration and departmental guidance and legislation from you all, sir. Yeah, oh, well, yeah that's great. Um, uh, I only have 20 seconds, so I'll ask the question, but it, we, may, we may be able to come back. So I'll give you a heads up. It's just a, a question about the Jake and specifically the AI education strategy uh, that was part of the 2020 NDAA. So if you have an update on that and specifically uh, on that as well, um, any information on the DOD's perspective, on your perspective on the National Security Commission on AI and identification uh, to be AI, re AI ready by 2025 and will we be ready with that? I'll yield back, and you can chew on that while we work through the first round. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Arson. Uh, Mr. Moore is recognized five minutes. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, thank you all for being here. The, the intelligence community, through its commercial cloud enterprise initiative, recently moved away from its previous approach of utilizing one cloud provider and has instead adopted a new approach to cloud computing. Generally, I, uh, I'm in favor of increasing competition and innovation. I believe this ensures access to the latest emerging technologies and the benefit of price competition, as well as the ability to procure services based on specific workload uh, and, those, and the needs with that. I'm interested in learning how the Pentagon has approached cloud computing in order to maximize the benefits of competition while the crucial balance, while balancing the needs of managing highly sensitive, often classified a DOD material. So my a question um, to Mr. Sherman, the Pentagon's $10 billion JEDI program has been mere, meaning ongoing years-long litigation. One of the key objectives for the JEDI contract is to move at the speed of relevance to support the delivery and sharing information in real time for our nation's warfighters, but with years of delays that has still not happened. I know JEDI is in litigation, and your comments may be short on specifics, but can you speak generally about how the Office of, of CIO is approaching cloud currently and what plans are in place or being made for the Department of for Future Cloud Services? Yes, sir. So starting with cloud writ large, we went from a situation where we had 
maybe almost a thousand flowers blooming to really starting to consolidate down where we have roughly a dozen, as we'd call them, fit for purpose clouds. You've heard of some of them, Mill Cloud 2.0, the Air Force's Cloud One, the new Cloud Army, Sea Army as they call it, and I go into some others, where we're using those as platforms for software development for some of the AI activity at the unclassified and secret level in some cases. Some are on-premises, some are off-premises. But this gets into that in my opening statement about the cloud conversancy in the department. Moving from a capital expenditure or CapEx model to where we maintain all the infrastructure and all the hardware to an OPEX or operations expenditure model, which we would use in a cloud setting. So it's not only having the software development, the DevSecOps, workloads, but learning how to live and operate in a cloud environment, and that we've done. So we've been able to work on that across the services, across the enterprise, and with the defense agencies and field activities. To your point, we still also have an urgent unmet need for an enterprise cloud capability at all three security levels, unclassified, secret, and top secret, that extends all the way from the headquarters all the way to the tactical edge. And that has not gone away at this time. And as Deputy Secretary Hicks made some recent public statements, we are continuing to assess our next steps vis-a-vis -vis the what comes next or what should we be doing uh, with that enterprise cloud urgent and unmet need. And that's where we are right now in the cloud movie, sir, pending your further questions. Is um, would, would leveraging public private partnerships uh, help in that regard? Like, given the fact that, you know, a, a, a healthy majority of cyber infrastructure in this country is owned by the private industry, um, do you see an opportunity to leverage that um, with, with those particular challenges and, and, and moving forward? I think some of the main challenges, and we do obviously want to work very closely with our industry partners on their best capabilities, gets into the cyber secure, cybersecurity realm. As we've seen, as we move from different impact levels, as we would call from IL or impact level two, which is what we just did on that commercial virtual remote, that, that COVID era remote work capability, up now to what we call DOD 365 to get onto an impact level five enclave that, that in this case, Microsoft Health set up for us in different tenants, of which we have 13 of them. So, sir, a lot of that, we, we appreciate the public-private partnership, but for the Department of Defense and for our mission, cybersecurity is going to be paramount in that discussion. Yeah, and I would agree with with, with that. I mean, I it started these, this questioning where talking about the intelligence community so and and absolutely respect that uh I, I look at i look at our space force right and how our space force is able to leverage um so much from the from the private sector uh just just you kind know, of thinking about you know how we can create more efficiencies and and leverage it obviously paramount is is the um the classification and the ability to do that so uh with 20 seconds left i'll, I'll yield back and, and and thank you very much yes sir Thank you, Mr. Moore. Uh, Ms. Houlihan is now recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I just would like to say I find this this testimony riveting, and so I appreciate the conversation, uh, and I'm glad to be here to to ask you questions. Uh, I guess my first question uh, has to do with a letter that I recently sent to Secretary Austin with several of my colleagues, and it asked the DOD to implement a mandatory training on digital literacy and cyber citizenship within the DOD. The proposed defense budget would set aside $30.8 million to help the Pentagon improve tools to identify and address extremism amongst troops and to enhance training at all levels. It also included $9.1 million to take initial steps to fight extremism and insider threats. I was wondering if you might be able to share a little bit of detail on what sort of tools there would be possibly and trainings there would be possibly and what they might look like. For digital literacy, ma'am, or uh, yes, sir. countering extremists specifically? Digital literacy. The idea here, sir, is that we need to make sure that everybody has understanding of how to assess truth and how, you know, literacy is an, a set of skills that's not just reading, but it's also numeracy, it's financial literacy, it's also uh, just kind of civics engagement and understanding, you know, how to understand when you're being uh, not told the truth. And so the digital literacy would be for our troops in that area. Ma'am, at a high level, I will say, I know there are training opportunities all across the enterprise in terms specifically for those operating, and ma'am, I know you've got a lot of experience in this from Hanscom and elsewhere, for those operating in the digital space. 
But in terms, I'd like to take this for the record to give you a holistic answer, because I'm going to be honest with you, I haven't had a chance to drill down on exactly how much we have for the everybody's digital, of course. But if I'm not working in the information technology or cybersecurity, and if I'm in operations, let's say, which I think is what your letter is getting at, I'd like to get back to you and take a look at that and see exactly what we have on the shelf and what we can do to expand what you're getting at to beyond the the standard computer-based training on on things like avoiding cybersecurity threats, sure. but a avoiding or doing the right thing. So, ma'am, I'd like to take that for the record and come back to you. No, I that. appreciate that, and I'd love to follow up with you on that. Uh, my next question is uh, about investment in STEM uh, to make sure that we have competitive um, cyber professionals that are able to meet our nation's workforce demands. And so I'm really interested in your cyber accepted service. At the hearing in April before the Senate Armed Service P Personnel Committee, the Acting Secretary for Defense for Civilian Personnel testified that cyber exceptional service was important and that authorities have been uh, able to enhance recruitment of cyber professionals. He pointed to the uh, flexibility and compensation and classification of work requirements as examples of how this program has been able to better meet targeted cyber needs. We also received testimony in the subcommittee from the U.S. Cybercom commander that the mission and the opportunity to work with colleagues of such caliber provides the most unique and important competitive advantage than compensation when competing with the commercial industry. So I'd like to hear your take on what it is, what is and what isn't working with cyber accepted service from an IT perspective rather than from a personnel perspective. Do you agree with the assessments that we've heard previously? What would you like Congress to know about what is and what isn't working as we continue to examine these and other authorities to meet the DOD's cyber needs? I think at a high level, I think CS is working well. I think, and as I put in my written testimony, we've got about 9,000 civilian positions that it could apply to, and we've got about 6,500 that have been converted. This has been as us at an enterprise level, learning how to use this capability to the best advantage, getting it out there to the different services and components on how to use it. And also, as we use the target local, targeted local market supplement, TLMS, to the best advantage, and the other capabilities that CS provides us for expedited hiring and benefits and so on to get that talent in the door. I would say this really does have to be nested in a broader cyber workforce strategy which I've actually launched and we aim to publish early next year on what is it we're trying to do with CES and all these other tools in our toolkit here and to increase the diversity, the capability, the conversancy of our workforce for the 21st century threats and also leveraging back to the, the, uh, the STEM training, things like the NSA scholarship program they have and being able to fit that in on, and also the accreditation they have for institutions around the country from junior colleges up to four-year institutions. So what I saw lacking was we didn't have one place. We had a little bit in our cyber strategy. We need a cyber workforce strategy. And as a matter of fact, I chaired the first, I need to make sure I get this right, the SWIMB, the Cyber Workforce Management Board. We hadn't held one in a year. I said, we need to hold one, which we, <clears throat> excuse me, I co-chair with uh, personnel resources and, um, and uh, PCA, to be able to start to look at these hard problems that you're getting at, ma'am, with CES and some of these other talent issues we've got to get right. I know my time has expired, and I yield back. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Houlihan. Um, before we go to the second round, is there any member uh, who is uh, not asked a question in the first round that wants to ask a question? Make sure that nothing, our members remotely. Okay. Um, hearing none, uh, we're going to move to the second round, and uh, I'll recognize myself uh, for the first uh, round of second questions. Um, so out of the, uh, the 17 unfunded priority uh, lists submitted by DOD uh, components and commands, there are a total of $1.2 billion in IT-related uh, requests, obviously no small number. Uh, as the DOD uh, official responsible, for compiling and certifying the department's IT and cyberspace activities budget. Uh, what does it say that the various components have identified uh, IT and cyber requirements uh, and may judge to be critical, but do not prioritize them uh, enough in the normal budget process to make sure that they are in the president's budget? So as a CIO, this is an ongoing thing we need to always be looking at. 
we have certified the budget as required for sufficiency to ensure that as we look at our digital modernization priorities that the components submitting the services and so on have funded sufficiently to reach that as well as within the submitted budget the increase roughly I think five or so percent since last year we have seen an increase our, our submitted increase to get after what we need to get to but to your point about you for sir being able to have the governance to work with them to ensure that this is being submitted properly and not outside of what we're certifying is something I will continue to focus on as CIO to ensure we can get this right but I feel that we have certified a good budget, that we have what we need to cover down on digital modernization priorities, and we'll continue to watch this closely with our component colleagues. Uh, okay. Um, so uh, I have uh, consistently advocated for uh, more dedicated senior leadership uh, and, and focus for electromagnetic spectrum operations uh, at the department. Uh, Mr. Sherman, uh, in your written testimony, you wrote that the CIO has been assigned and designated as uh, senior official for long-term implementation of the 2020 spectrum uh, superiority strategy. When will this uh, implementation plan be released and how do you intend to carry it out and why will this plan be successful while uh, other others have fallen short. So uh, on the question, we expect the implementation plan to be signed very soon by the Secretary. I don't have an exact date, but we've got this teed up, ready to go. And in terms of why it will be successful, the commitment from the department, from the Joint Chiefs to the OSD side, and recognizing that we've got to get this right in a near peer competitor environment. And not that we haven't been focusing on this during the wars in Afghanistan and Iraq, but as we look at China and Russia and other adversaries in that regard, electromagnetic spectrum is gonna be critical, just as critical as kinetic, long range fires, space, cyberspace, and so on. We've got to be successful. So the commitment from the chairman, the vice chairman, secretary, deputy secretary, and everybody has been very strong. So. We're confident that we're going to have what we need. And back, I think, to your middle question, sir. We do. We are the main overseeing official for this. The vice chairman, through the joint staff, is leading a CFT, a functional team, working on this. And come start of fiscal 22, we're going to take the baton as the implementing office for this. So we are the overall lead, responsible official for the department. Joint staff is working the CFT, and we're ready to pick that up. And, sir, I feel we've got the commitment on this across the services and the seriousness recognizing the threats we face right now. Very good. All right. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, uh, with that, uh, since Ms. Bice has not uh, answer, uh, asked a question yet, I'll uh, yield to uh, Ms. Bice for uh, five minutes. Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman, for holding this important hearing today. Um, <clears throat> Mr. Sherman, thank you for being here. The DOD's cloud strategy calls for three clouds, Mill Cloud 2.0, a secure on-premise cloud, the Defense Enterprise Solutions, cloud-based secure collaboration solution, and the JEDI, general purpose cloud. Um, fourth estate agencies were directed to move to the Mill Cloud 2.0, but adoption has been incredibly slow. To date, only 3% of the targeted workloads have migrated to the Mill Cloud. Uh, this is delayed realization of enhanced security, which is paramount in the light of the most recent Colonial Pipeline and solar wind cybersecurity attacks. Um, a little bit of background. I come from a, back, uh, a family business that has dealt in the technology space, and I recognize the critical need for us to protect our assets, especially in the cyberspace. Will the DOD enforce the 2018 mandate directing Mill Cloud 2.0 migration by the fourth estate? We're going to ensure that it's being used where it can be used and ensuring that the DAFAs, the defense agencies and field activities that need the on-prem capability that it provides are going to use it. In terms of 
what was directed in 2018. I'm frankly, from my seat, going to take a more nuanced approach on this. MillCloud 2.0 is a powerful capability on-prem, to your point. It operates at IL-5. It's not yet accredited at IL-6 secret. And roughly 25% of the DAFA migrations that have occurred from legacy to cloud-based solutions have gone to MillCloud 2.0. It's a powerful arrow in our quiver, but not the only one. And so I, that's the approach I'm taking on this. It is definitely a good capability to have, but it's not our only capability. And so that's how I'm approaching this, ma'am. If I may follow up. So you're, you're suggesting only 25% has migrated to Mill Cloud. What is the other 75% doing? They're going to other cloud-based capabilities. Amazon, Microsoft, and DISA provided cloud capabilities to get off of legacy platforms. Do you feel like the migrating to those particular platforms uh, provides um, a security that you feel comfortable with? Yes, ma'am, it does. Okay. Uh, Follow-up question to that, if I can. Um, our adversaries have made it known that they plan to use artificial intelligence to gain a competitive advantage in cyberspace. What is the DOD doing to match and exceed any capabilities our adversaries might develop in this space to defend our assets and ensure DOD can effectively carry out its mission? What keeps you up at night? What keeps me up at night are cyber threats of the kind we're seeing across the country, not only against the government, but against the private sector. This is the main reason I am so committed to moving out with the zero trust implementation at the Department of Defense. I want DOD to be a leader in this space. Zero trust has been bandied about for years. Some in the private sector may have achieved this at some level, but no department has at the level I'm suggesting. With an assumption that the adversary is on the network, we must segment in a way we never have before, instrument the network in a way we haven't with, and using things like identity credential access management, endpoint security, comply to connect, and it's not one thing you buy, but a host of capabilities. I know what the Chinese and Russians want to do to our networks, and this is the most important role I have as CIO, along with other types of modernization for our warfighters, keeping our network safe. I've often noted that right now the, uh, the offensive side has all the capability, and we on the defensive side have got to run a new defense, to use one of my football terms. We're going to run a new defense. That's what keeps me up, and it's going to involve making it about the data in the systems as well as, ma'am, artificial intelligence, how we can bring that to bear so we don't segment ourselves and have to have tens of thousands of defenders doing the work that a set of AI algorithms can do. So that's going to be part of zero trust as well. Mr. Sherman, I, I appreciate your answer. One of the concerns I have, however, is um, looking at, as a freshman legislator, I'm probably bringing a different perspective, uh, the time it is taking to actually get these services migrated to either cloud-based solutions or others that can protect our assets. Uh, we talked about MillCloud 2.0 being implemented in 2018, and here we are three years later with a very small percentage that have been migrated. Um, how can we effectively speed things up in a way that will make sure that we are doing it in a thoughtful pro way, but we're also protecting our assets? Ma'am, I would just add of the defense agencies and field activities, the first 14 of them in our first tranche, we moved 97% of their applications off legacy to cloud of the four areas I talked about, as well as the services have made great progress, shut down legacy data centers, and got to manage services like cloud. We are moving aggressively in this direction, recognizing the vulnerability of legacy to cybersecurity threats. So we appreciate your comments on that, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you, Ms. Bice. Uh, Mr. Larson is now recognized five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, thanks for sticking around for my second round of questions. Appreciate it. Uh, I had a question regarding, uh, first off, Section 256 of the uh, FY20 NDA, which required the DOD to develop an AI, educa AI education strategy, and Jake is responsible for that effort. Uh, do you have an update on that? Sir, I'm going to have to take this for the record. Yep. As the Jake no longer reports to me directly, they're close colleagues. Um, we work hand in glove with them, but some of their specific initiatives, sir, I wouldn't feel comfortable articulating. I would defer that to General Groen and the Jake leadership, so I'd like to take that for the record to give you an accurate answer back on that, sir. That's fine. And then to follow up uh, on some AI I mentioned earlier, um, if, if the uh, I asked if the DOD CIO had perspective on whether or not we're AI ready, the National uh, Security Commission on AI is, uh, has a variety of goals, including to be AI ready by 20. 25. Um, do you think the department will be 
AI ready by 2025? Yes, sir. I think holistically we're doing the right things to be AI ready. We've answered, we've talked about cloud a little bit here in terms of what we have for cloud to host AI capabilities and algorithms. The cybersecurity pieces I've talked about with zero trust are going to be critical for artificial intelligence. I will come back to our urgent and unmet need for an enterprise-wide cloud capability from headquarters to the tactical edge. That's going to be important for AI, and it will go to what Deputy Secretary Hicks announced last week with the AI and Data Accelerator Initiative, or ADA, as we're calling it, mm -hmm. to be able to work across the combatant commands and unlock the power of AI for the COCOMs. Uh, as well using cloud-based technology. So I think we're leaning in the right direction, but we've got some work to do. So on, on that on that point, though, then, um, who's responsible for, for lack of a better term, educating the COCOMs on the use of algorithms for the for purposes they define? I think this is exactly the ADA initiative that Deputy Secretary Hicks announced with these AI teams that will be going to the COCOMs, as well as data teams, ODTs, op operational data teams, working together on both the data side and the AI side, starting at places like Northcom, Indopaycom, and so on, getting in there with the users and the various J-Code staffs and so on, and working on everything from the algorithm development, building on, say, what Maven has done, and also on the data side, working on things like Advana and what the data capabilities are and merging that together. So these these teams that are coming out are going to be a key accelerator for that, sir. Yeah. Um, I might have missed it, but uh, maybe I didn't. Do you, um, do you have an update, or do you are you directly involved with CMMC and uh, with the role of cybersecurity plays with these smaller suppliers? Sir, only in so far as I had one of my senior executives participate in the CMMC review, which was conducted by ANS as a subject matter expert to contribute to that, and then only as CMMC connects to our broader de defense industrial base security that we're working like through the strategic cybersecurity program, but directly, no, sir. No. CMMC I'm aware of, but not directly yeah. leading. Yeah, sure, I understand. And we'll follow up. Uh, um with other folks on that. Uh, with that, Mr. Chair, I will yield back. Thanks. Very good. Thank you, Mr. Larson. Uh, the ranking member, Mr. Franklin, is now recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, two follow-on questions. Um, all the services who've come before us have talked about the need for more uh, folks trained in the area of cybersecurity. It's a hot job market in the outside private sector. Uh, what difficulties are you facing in hiring individuals with the skill sets you need, and, and what are you doing to address any shortfalls? Sir, I think about this almost every day as I look out my window over at Crystal City and then as I walk out to my truck and look over at Roslyn and the number of our private sector partners who are competing for some of the very same talent here. This gets to the, strategic, the cybersecurity workforce strategy I spoke about a minute ago. We've got to come at this differently here. We're using the Cyber Accepted Service, as mentioned, to get talent in here. We're using things like the NSA educational programs to get to the colleges and institutions. We have to broaden the aperture on this, sir. I feel very strongly about this. This is going to take a whole-of-nation approach. We talk about diversity. It's critical. And I mean diversity and not only race, gender, but also geographic placement. We can't keep going to the same wells and recruiting in the same places. I want to broaden the aperture of the sort of talent we can bring in to the Department of Defense. And we may need to think differently, too, working with our PNR colleagues about I'm not sure if we want to hire a data scientist for 30 years. Maybe she comes in for three or four years, gets the skills there, gets the, the patriotic duty for DOD and the returns of the private sector, and then comes back to us in some number of years. We're going to have to work with our colleagues in intelligence and security on how we work clearance issues with that. I'm both excited by this but also daunted because of the competitive environment in which we live with our private sector colleagues and the whole of nation approach this is going to take to stand up against our adversaries, sir. One last question. Uh, in the physical domain, a commander would be held accountable if he or she uh, lost equipment or mishandled it. To what extent do you believe commanders are held sufficiently accountable for not caring, caring, caring for DOD information and system in their care? Sir, this is an evolving area that we've talked about quite a bit. Part of the issue, and I 
felt passionately about this myself. If you roll out of a motor pool with that proper ammunition or fuel on your fighting vehicle or off pushing the ship off the dock, et cetera, you're held accountable for that. Part of it has to get on how we can ensure that there's instrumentation and that the commanders and the, the, the ship drivers and the maneuver commanders and others know what is going on on their weapons platform. So if there's going to be accountability with this, we've got to be able to monitor what's actually going on there. And then what does it mean in terms of readiness? So that's an evolving discussion we're having, again, with our PNR colleagues on this. But what does cyber accountability mean? But one key thing on this, sir, that I'm working to do, and this is an area that I want to inject with here with you all on the legislative side and industry partners and elsewhere, we use terms like cyber hygiene, which can make people glaze over. Sir, I know you're a former operator. Sometimes cyber hygiene might people go, well, that's something for the, the CIO or the, the, the six, the J6. I want to use a term called cyber survivability. This is something, as a former Bradley guy myself, this will get my attention, that if I'm going to be taken down by this by an adversary, we've got to change how we think about cybersecurity. So, sir, these are the kinds of things we're looking at. We need different tools in our toolbox working with PNR, and we have brought this up to our leadership, and we have some work to do on it, sir. Thanks, and I agree. You know, from, from a Navy standpoint, it's just it's always been known that uh, the captain is ultimately responsible. It doesn't matter if he or she's on the bridge. If the ship goes aground, you're relieved of command. And at some point, I think we're going to have to understand that the potential damage from cyber uh, intrusions are going to be just as serious as any of those. But I appreciate your comments there. And I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Yes, sir. Very appropriate comments, too, I, I would say. Um, um, thank you, uh, Mr. Franklin. And... Uh, Ms. Houlihan is now ready. Actually, before I go to Ms. Houlihan, I just want to remind members that uh, as soon as we adjourn here, we are going to be going up to uh, 2212 for uh, the classified uh, uh, portion of this uh, of this hearing. So I hope everyone can uh, go up there for the classified portion. Uh, with that, uh, Ms. Houlihan is now recognized for uh, for five minutes. Thank you. Uh, my last and final question has to do with our allies. And I had the opportunity to meet with several of our def of their defense attaches. Uh, they were talking about how their nations have implemented effective cybersecurity protocols, or at least what they believe to be effective cybersecurity protocols, and managing potential cyber attacks and intrusions. And in their opinion, sometimes better than the United States. Has the DOD sought to work closely with our allies to determine what cybersecurity practices are working for our other nations? Absolutely, ma'am. One of the things I'm privileged to do is work, for example, with our Five Eyes to Defense CIOs. Matter of fact, just two weeks ago, we were, would have been meeting in person but for COVID, but we held a multi-day virtual conference going over not only cybersecurity but how we can work together to modernize as I work with my colleagues in the Five Eyes, but other nations as well, such as Singapore I had a meeting with recently. As we talk about things like zero trust, there may be different terminologies, but how do we segment networks? How do we instrument things? How do we train our workforce back to the talent piece? So yes, ma'am, we have robust conversations. And one thing coming from the intelligence side, having the privilege to work with allies for many years, um, we in the United States do a lot of things right, but we have a lot to learn from allies, too, and I value that highly. And many of them are women and men who have great experience in the private sector before they went to their governments, and so we do have very active discussions on this area, ma'am. Has there been discussion in the DOD or with our allies about developing a formal comprehensive approach to cybersecurity or global cyber infrastructure? So some of this would get into probably, in terms of cybersecurity, I don't think we've talked formally about that. I would also have to defer to General Nakasone through Cybercom, some of those channels, what he may be setting up. So I'll take that one for the record to make sure we get you a whole answer. But from the CIO side, we do have a lot of engagements, but maybe not quite to the level of, of a formal structure that you're getting at on that, ma'am. Thanks. And my last uh, question is something that you talked about with uh, kind of workforce coming in and out, uh, starting with you all as an example, and then going to the private sector, and then perhaps looping back around later on mid-career. And you talked about something that is uh, an important part of that, which is uh, clearances. Can you reflect for a little bit on what does that mean? How do ha I'm a person who held a, a TSSCI clearance decades ago, came back around, and now I'm here again. And we have a very different process, which we can talk about later on how we reestablish those clearances here. But how would that happen? And is there anything congressionally or federally that we can be doing to make that easier for people? 
Ma'am, I would really have to defer to my colleagues in intelligence and security and DCSA, but I would just flag as someone who's worked in intelligence and now seeing the kind of how this would work, we are going to have to get our head around this as a person leaves government service, works in a private sector academic setting, they're necessarily going to have foreign contacts in a globalized, and I know you're well aware of this, ma'am, and when they come back, let's say they want to come back at a higher rank, maybe a slightly different role, we're going to have to figure out how we don't make them wait 12, 18 plus months. And so I think this is something we need to look at, and again, on the cyber workforce strategy, this is something I want to start to put some markers down as really firm requirements for us to think differently. Because the more we reflect on this, 30-year careers may work for some, but as we look at the digital and cyber space, this is not going to be best for us back to as we we're talking from a whole of nation approach. So I don't know if we need any anything legislatively just yet, but I think we need to get our head around kind of what the steps of this would look like, ma'am. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And with uh, a final comment, I really was interested in the ranking chair's comments about um, kind of how we have responsibility to understand what the liabilities are and the, and the frankly, the punishments are uh, for people who are in command and control of cyberspace, so to speak. And I'm really intrigued and would look forward to learning more about that with, with everybody on the committee. Yes, ma'am. And uh, nothing to add on that, but just recognizing cyber accountability, mm -hmm. maybe a new term, is something we definitely need to consider the same as poor maintenance or poor training as before a unit pushes out. So thank you, ma'am. Thank you. I yield back. Thank you, Ms. Houlihan. Uh, Mr. Moore is now recognized for five minutes. Mr. Moore is still with us. Remotely. Um, Okay, I'll hold there. I'm going to uh, yield to Ms. Bice for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I actually want to uh, really tack on to Representative Houlihan's comments about uh, the clearance process. I think one of the things that we've heard over and over is that uh, it's taking too long. And, and sort of to that point, when we're talking about recruitment, uh, we often think of sort of the uh, high-tech universities, maybe West Coast universities, the Stanfords of the world to go recruit from. What are you all doing to really look at uh, other institutions of higher learning that have a fantastic program that maybe hadn't been thought of in the past. And I'll use uh, a university in Oklahoma, the University of Tulsa, it has a, a fantastic cyber program that they're really uh, doing some innovative work on. In. How are you looking at this from a workforce standpoint? So I'll tell you how we're looking from CIO, and I think our PNR colleagues could absolutely amplify this with greater detail. The NSA accreditation, I don't have the list here in front of me, of, of several hundred institutions, again, from junior colleges, and I would have to look in the state of Oklahoma, man, but I know there's several there, to be able to and, and partner institutions together to help bootstrap each other, as some have gotten the accreditation, to get the get the students there. And this is what I really feel strongly about. I come from a rural area myself, LaWard, Texas. You know, everywhere from, from very rural areas to urban areas, from mainland U.S. to U.S. territories, it's going to take us looking very broadly. So to your point, I, that's one thing I'm trying to push as CIO through this upcoming workforce strategy. I will say I believe recruitment as expanded over the last several years into these areas, and the NSA accreditation that General Makasoni's team lead has helped, again, ever from two-year junior colleges up to four-year institutions, major Big 12 or Big 10 schools and SEC and so on all across the nation uh, to be able to do that. So that's what we're trying to do to broaden the aperture from, and, and also maybe looking at, uh, we do have a new tool we're looking at kind of matching talent to job positions, looking more broadly but, uh, beyond just the degree they have, what types of experiences they have to be able to get folks in there. And this is, of course, something the private sector, I know you noted, ma'am, is looking very carefully at, too, in terms of what degree requirements does someone really need to be a coder? How do we get them in the door? So those are the kind of things I'm, again, excited and daunted, but I think if we get this right, this is what's going to give us the advantage on the PRC and others. We've got the talent out there. We just got to get them in the door. It is fantastic to hear you talk about that. And uh, Representative Hulahan and I sit on a supply chain task force that talks has been talking a lot about workforce and how do we engage uh, various, uh, you know, and young people and getting engaged in this that may not be going to a four-year college but still have the uh, aptitude to be able to engage in these uh, conversations. So I appreciate your comments on that. Um, if you can kind of pivot for just a minute, can you talk a little bit about how 
uh, you are coordinating with other government agencies, CISA, for example, to really look at a whole of government approach in protecting um, our assets and, and addressing cybersecurity issues. We've seen all of these intrusions lately. And so it's not just DOD that could be impacted, but you have all these other agencies that are also kind of coordinating. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yes, well, there's the interagency process. My friend and colleague, Ann Newberger, up at the NSC is a deputy national security advisor up there. And, of course, we have Mr. English as the national English is a national cyber director through their various forums, through the National Security Council and so on. We have, you know, the new cyber executive order has been a good thing to help us unify as a government on these things. And, of course, there's other uh, governance fora we have. The federal CIO has meetings as well as with the federal CISO and also the kind of informal networks we have with DHS, CISA, with other agencies, and, of course, with where I come from, the intelligence community, uh, governance bodies we have on national security systems, on things like accreditation and looking at policies and practices. So there's quite a bit. You noted CISA, obviously, close work, and as they have the, the .gov and, and helping secure the federal side. And then also we have what we're doing through the Joint Force Headquarters, DOTEN, JFHQ DOTEN, that General Skinner leads, has much contact with them. So I think there's robust dialogue back and forth and best practices. And I do have to say the cyber EO and the focus that we have there has helped us kind of unify around some best practices, everything from zero trust to supply chain to how we're going to look at these problems, ma'am. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you, Ms. Bice. Uh, that concludes the member questions, as I understand it. Uh, so with that, uh, the subcommittee will recess uh, and then will immediately reconvene in 2212 for the classified portion of this hearing. Uh, the committee stands in recess. <laughs>